Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Walport, and I chair the UK Galleon Prize Committee. Um, and thank you all for coming this afternoon, and thank you particularly to all the people that are going to um, educate and entertain us with the three um, round tables, as it were. I, this is a very appropriate place to have it. I mean, the Science Museum is a wonderful place. Um, uh, the amazing picture by Terence Cuneo is, I think, really the sort of second industrial revolution, um, whereas, uh, debatably, we're either in the, the third or the fourth um, industrial revolution. And, of course, we're seeing that now coming through in terms of the sorts of innovation that are changing um, human uh, health and um, providing new diagnostics, new treatments. It is an utterly extraordinary time at a time of uh, utterly extraordinary need, actually. Um, I'm going to say more this evening, so I'm only going to be rather brief now. Uh, Terence Cuneo is actually famous because he would hide mice in his paintings. Um, I've looked very hard at that painting, and I can't find a mouse. And it may just be that the scale of that one is so monumental, where the people are only about three feet or two feet tall. So the mice would be very small indeed. So maybe they're just dots in his... Um, um, but it's, it's, if you see his paintings, they're very distinctive. Anyway, enough of that. Um, uh, enjoy this afternoon and do participate actively. So there will be panel discussion, but the panel discussion will get even more interesting if you are provocative from the audience. So talk lots and let me uh, hand over to Matt. Thank you, Mark. Um, I'm very excited about being the first panel, um, and we're going to focus on COVID learnings, specifically in R&D, and actually I'm very humbled by the panel I've managed to pull together. So I'm going to do some quick intros for them, and then put a question to them, and then really open it to you so we can have a really good discussion. So first off, I've got Sir Mene, um, well, Professor Sir Mene Pangalos, responsible for biopharma R&D and discovery through late-stage uh, cross CVRM respiratory immunology, vaccines, immune therapy, and neuroscience at AstraZeneca. Next, I've got Chris Corsico, Global Head of Development at GSK, responsible for development and oversight of GSK's late-stage portfolio. Then I've got Moxa. Professor Sir Martin Lanry, Professor of Medicine and Epidemiology at University of Oxford and Chief Executive of Protus, a not-for-profit focused on the design and delivery of highly efficient randomized trials of treatments for major public health conditions. Then I've got Ali Holland, Head of Decentralized Clinical Trials at Medable, to design and expand the end-to-end -end capabilities needed to partially or fully virtualize clinical trial studies. Um, 20 years plus experience across a number of leadership roles. And then last but not least, Dame, <laughs> Dr. June Rain, Chief Executive of the MHRA since 2019, chairs the Executive Committee, the highest decision-making body in the agency, and before that was Director of Vroom for 20 years. So, Manils. And I'll start with you. Okay. In terms of yeah, <laughs> in terms of learnings and clinical trials excellence, how do you think what you've learned from COVID could be applied to other diseases? Uh, okay, great. First of all, thank you for, for having us. It's a pleasure to be here. And we were just joking um, or talking before we got onto the stage about um, how the probably the biggest learnings I would really like not to have to go through another pandemic again. Um, <laughs> but joking aside. I think what the pandemic has done is actually accelerated many things that were maybe in train or in flow and kind of put things as, uh, as Monte Brazil on, on warp speed in terms of um, the program that was running in the US. So what, you know, what are the things that, that we've learned? Well, we've learned how to work with um, people like June and other regulatory authorities around the world in a very different way to how we traditionally work. Normally, it would be a back and forth with lots of waiting in between. Um, I think the process of interacting with regulators we were running through our programs was much more interactive and much more in real time and solution orientated, which obviously would be fantastic if we could continue across all of our therapy areas. I don't think it'll continue in quite the same way, but I definitely see a move in the right direction in terms of how we're engaging with regulators and the MHRA, I think, is uh, leading the way. I think that the types of risks that we took as we were thinking about our vaccine program, working with Oxford and our antibody programs were doing a lot more things with parallel processing where normally you would do things sequentially in this instance because of the um, you know, social and, and global need, we took risks to do things in parallel, so move multiple antibodies forward simultaneously 
do um, tech transfers, not in one place sequentially, but in 20 places simulta simultaneously. Now, of course, the intensity of that isn't sustainable. Um, but what I would say is that there are now a few programs that we have within the company where we're thinking about, well, where can we take more risk with a program that's particularly competitive or particularly important or particularly urgent? And you won't do it for 20 programs in your pipeline, but you might do it for one or two, and as a consequence, help them move a little bit faster than they would otherwise move. The other big innovation or big acceleration for us, has, I think, has been not so much um, in the COVID programs, but actually in the non-COVID programs, by the fact of the way the world changed, you know, how many of us had done Zoom and Teams meetings um, before the pandemic, that's now a new norm, but actually how we run our clinical studies, and Martin, I'm sure, will we'll talk about this as well, but we had to work out how to get our um, test drug substance to patients instead of to sites. We had to work out how to do remote monitoring of patients for endpoints. We had to work out how to make the trials more patient and site-friendly. And we had to do this at a time while the pandemic was happening. And then there's also the added consequence of when everyone's in lockdown, for example, you're running a COPD study, people aren't exacerbating. So what are the endpoints you're going to measure in your phase two studies that are going to enable you to measure exacerbations? We had to start thinking about how we change our endpoints. So all of those types of things, I think, have made us think about how we do things going forwards now in certain areas um, differently, and I think are actually going to speed up um, research and development. Thank you very much. Chris, if I can ask you, so I know that based on the final note, Benny, you said you'd prefer not to have to do it for every single program, but I think there is, or we're at least hearing in the consulting world of pressure to continue to push cycle times. So I'm just thinking, Chris, you know, from your perspective, what do pharma companies still need to do to really push forward and reduce cycle time for medicines? So uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me, and it's a pleasure to be with uh, everyone on this panel. Um, I, let me build on some of the things that Mene was saying, because I, I'm going to start with this frame. While in a drug development scenario, most of the time we fail, COVID posed to us the challenge of failure was not an option, which meant we pivoted resources, focus, decision-making, and streamlined processes. In order to sustain that, we need to bring that same rigor across the portfolio. But as many said, and I fully agree, you can't do this across the board. And so it all starts with where is the patient? Where is the patient need? Um, what are the treatment options available? And that, does that create its own little ecosystem requiring you to move with that same mindset of failure is not an option? And I would contend if you're doing drug discovery and you want to make a difference in public health, you'd say, well, that should be a lot of your portfolio. That's correct. But within your portfolio, you also have to decide where am I more likely to succeed given mechanism, given what we know about the area. Um, have the endpoints changed enough that I might be able to do something in a slightly different fashion? I may be able to correlate with a clinical outcome and use that surrogate. And we know that's been done successfully in other areas well before COVID. So some of this is taking the streamlined approach internally, driving that focus, to be able to say, where are we going to place those smart bets across our portfolio in areas of huge unmet need? The issue is that we are also in an interdependency with many others in this ecosystem. And so working with academia, working with sites in a different way becomes important. And taking those learnings, um, because we've probably better mapped not only country idiosyncrasies, um, but also site idiosyncrasies to say, where will we be most successful to be able to go back and replicate this and then use those individuals to help bring that message forward to maybe those who are not comfortable with telemedicine or using remote monitoring to show them that it, it has worked and give them comfort to be able to move into the institution that way. And outside of a pandemic, we have a little more time to do that. And as, as many referenced, the partnership with regulators. Um, everyone has a role to play. Patient safety, data integrity, patient privacy are always paramount. But how do we get the back and forth to be able to move things quickly enough that we can move at pace but not compromise the end product for the patient? Thank you, Chris. 
And I think, Martin, there's been sort of mentions of your recovery trial and already kind of alluding and doing things differently. And so maybe talk to us a little bit about, you know, what does that mean for trials of the future? Well, thank you. Um, and, and thank you for inviting us. It's an unusual experience to do a workshop or a round table and actually see people rather than just uh, <laughs> four heads and a, a, and a black screen. Um, so, uh, I think, yeah, my approach for, the, for a number of years and I've had conversations with several people on the panel, uh, it has been about how do we tackle the challenge of common disease, common and life-threatening disease, uh, where by and large treatment effects are pretty modest, but the disease is common, and if you can have a modest effect on something that's common, you could make a substantial difference. And I've argued for some time that we need better design, largely simpler design, frankly, more integration with routine healthcare, the patient pathway, which actually starts mostly with patients at home because that's where they are, um, and also better use of data. And that that is a teamwork, it is a team sport. It does require everybody from pharma through academia, through the NHS and other clinical systems and the regulators and so on, to actually focus on what matters. So when the pandemic arrived, um, uh, it was one of those times where it was perfectly reasonable for everybody, everybody to say, we don't know what we're doing. Now, the reality in cardiology, which is where I work most of the time, is that most of the time we don't know what we're doing. 15% of international guidelines for cardiovascular disease treatment are based on randomized evidence, and the best, rest is based on something else, most of which is so-called expert opinion. Um, uh, so, but in COVID, it was possible to say, look, we don't know what we're doing, and it was possible to frame a, a question very clearly. One in four patients who go into hospital do not survive that hospital stay. That was the situation two years ago. Secondly, we've got a new virus. We have no treatments. There may be something in the, in the, in the cupboard already. And in due course, and we've studied a number of them, are studying a number of them, there will be some new treatments to come along. But how do we get a clear in, and compelling result on what, which drugs reduce mortality and which don't? And I think the real lesson was focus on the question, focus on what you need in order to answer that question, and focus on making it doable. Anybody can design a trial that is hard to do. The trick is to design a trial that is easy to do and that everybody can take part in. I think we should discuss as we come forward is how much of those lessons are we going to hold on to, and how much are we going to go to back to so-called business as usual, or as I would put it, and we were discussing earlier, bad business as usual. Um, because what we were doing before was failing, failing patients, failing public health, failing drug development, um, uh, and failing, frankly, the economy too. So I think there's a huge question about do we really want to go back to where we were, and we have to uh, think and continue to think quite innovatively. Thank you, Martin. And I know, Ali, when we were prepping for this panel, you know, there's been a lot of talk of digital innovation and decentralized trials. And of course, a lot of what you do is spend time thinking through, you know, how can you actually accelerate and sustain trials using sort of some of the digital technologies? Maybe tell us a little bit about that and the role that COVID played to kind of bring that to the fore. Yeah, thank you. Again, uh, privileged to be here with uh, this panel and this audience today. So, you know, what we learned over the last couple of years um, is that our patients want to be part of this journey. Um, patients really want to be stakeholders in drug development. They want to be stakeholders in life sciences. We needed to find a more consumer-style approach to allow them to participate in a way that they could do so that felt familiar. And as we talked about earlier, um, we all became very familiar doing our business across Zoom. Our patients got very familiar using technology to communicate with their families to, and break down some of those technology barriers such that with really well-designed platforms and really well-designed tools, actually technology that we had maybe assumed as an industry was prohibitive and, and not patient-centric and not patient-friendly became very possible and feasible and allows us to give choices to our patients about how they can know about a trial, find it accessible and um, be able to participate in a way of their choice. It doesn't mean that they always have to be decentralized. They can choose to come to the hospital, but we can acquire some of that data from source directly from our patients, either through sensors, through patient reported outcomes, through acquired data from ingested data, such that we're no longer re reliant on hand collected and hand entered and manually hand checked data all the way through the clinical trials, which has really built a huge amount of bureaucracy 
and time and efficiency into the drug development cycle times. And if we can start to eliminate some of that, we A, put our patients first and, and include them in that story, we give them choices, and we accelerate the time to be able to see the data that matters and make real-time decisions about how to move forward and how to adapt the development cycle in real time with, with really high quality data. Thank you, Ali. And I think, June, there's been a lot of sort of allusion to the importance of regulators, particularly in COVID. And I know you've worked with many of the panel here. Um, what about regulatory flexibilities that sort of came to the fore during COVID? And, you know, what's the future hold in that respect? Well, thank you, Myrto. Delighted to be here and to relive some of those experiences. And I think what comes out of what we've heard so far is that intense pressure and urgency, which we have to think will not be there for the future as we judge what flexibilities we will take. But actually, I'd like to say something else. It was a period of intense excitement and taking risks that we hadn't taken before and doing so in an outcome-focused way. Regulators are largely renowned for being very procedural, very conscious of our pathways and our processes. We became outcome-focused. We did things at risk and encouraged others to do thing, things at risk, and we focused on partnership working. And these are all things that aren't commonly said by regulators. So what do we bottle for the future? What do we bring back? I'll say something about innovation, something about partnership working, and finally, the international piece. I think with innovation, that's everything from rolling reviews to uh, pre-assessment uh, reviews of trial protocols so that people are regulatory ready and hit the ground running. So there's a whole suite of innovative ways of doing things so that success is built in and uncertainty is taken out. That all takes us to the importance of partnerships. Again, it's a new concept. The regulator, though independent, isn't in a little silo or a bubble on its own. And I'm delighted to see colleagues from HTA here that partnership between the regulator, health technology assessment, and reaching across boundaries into the research community. So partnership working is here to say the rapid C19 that made sure that dexamethasone was standard of care on the day the results became available. That's what we need to bring back when there's a, a medical need. And then finally, international. The best way to influence on the flexibility question is to influence all regulators. And I'm delighted to say, particularly in the clinical trials piece, we're leading uh, work through ACCESS, Australia, Canada, Singapore, Switzerland, and at ICMRA, International Coalition of Medicines Regulators. And if those flexibilities are internationally embedded, regulation will be a whole different story. So let's do it. Thank you. Well, I'm going to come to the floor in a second for questions, so just to give you a chance to think. Um, but maybe, Ali, if I come back to you, and others might want to add here, um, we were talking about, you know, COVID sort of making you have to think about, how could I get a trial started and recruited in a day? Tell us a little bit about how do you make that possible? <laughs> yeah, with a lot of, uh, a lot of goodwill and, uh, and luck. But uh, I think, you know, we certainly aspire to say, you know, is it feasible, possible to aspire to shoot for the stars and say, could it be done in a day? Could you, how much could you learn? How much could you uh, pre-align with the regulators for approvals, with our protocol designs, with the um, patient-ready trial populations that could be created in the future such that it would be possible to pre-form that? And we've been working with a couple of our clients looking at um, creating populations of known patients and collecting data around those patients so that those patients actually inform the design of the studies in the future, including mutation data, including exacerbations and hospitalizations and how their disease progresses. So the trial is designed around how those patients live. And we have real life studies and testing the drugs in those parameters against the safety profiles and all of the good um, uh, catchments that we should have around the study, but really thinking about how do we change the cycle of how we even conceptualize the study, how we think about what the outcomes are that we need to be able to prove, and then think about different ways of actually designing the right endpoints and the right date to capture points to be able to collect that in real life, in real time. Thank you. Yeah, Mel. <laughs> Thank you. 
thank you. Um, excellent points uh, by the panellists. Uh, I wanted to pick up on something that June actually said about when there's a medical need. So you were talking about all of these sort of uh, innovative approaches and taking risks, but applying when there's a medical need. So what, what is sufficient medical need to, uh, in order to initiate these sort of new innovative approaches and flexibilities? What, would, what, what is the sort of threshold at which these could be really uh, driven forward? It's a great question, and it's kind of counterintuitive because we're talking about building back better for everything. And a good example is the rolling review. So a modular rolling review, which you've probably read on our website, would be for any appropriate situation, and it's what we want to put into the innovative licensing and access pathway. But when there's an urgency, we can debate all the criteria, then you would do a completely iterative, ongoing, um, as we did for COVID. So as soon as data became available, we shifted from modular into progressive. So th there's going to be judgment calls, and clearly we can debate exactly how you define medical need. Um, but I do think we need different pathways for different situations and ready to accelerate from one to the other. Say, I mean, Thank you. And, and some, some of those do exist. I mean, you know, we have breakthrough designations. We have fast track, I think, you know, based on the unmet medical need, the, the severity of the disease, the, you know, the data you have in hand in terms of you know, the, the transformational nature of if, it's, if it is a transformational therapy. I think regulators are moving now in a much more aggressive, I think, interactive, interactive way. The other piece I would just, I would just add, which I think is you know, recruiting all your patients in a 5,000 patient study is fantastic and I hope we can get there one day, but we're not close to it. But I do think the other place where I think regulates are moving, and we, we have an example of a um, randomized placebo-controlled, randomized registry study now in, in a trial called DAPRMI, which is around, I think, 6,500 patients. And it's using two randomized registries, one UK registry, one Finnish registry. And the investigator and patient burden on that type of study is about half of what it would be for a normal study, right? All of the monitoring, you know, this, so the, the monitoring is done as part of routine standard of care because the patient's already in registries and the rest of it's done with um, wearables and, 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 and monitoring at home. And all the adjudications are done actually using AI-based algorithms in an unbiased way. So the cost of that study is about half of what a normal phase three study outcome study would be. And the FDA and other regulators have been quite excited about it because it's one of the first randomized registry studies that would be for a you know, big indication like myocardial infarction, measuring outcomes. So that those types of things, I think, really are going to be transformational. The challenge we have is there aren't enough registries with good patient cohorts across all the disease areas we want to run these types of studies. So we need more of them. Could I build on those two points? I mean, I think, June, you're absolutely right about the level of interaction between regulators and those who are running the trials. Um, and my experience, I'm sure Manet's and others, um, both as you're setting up the trial, as you're modifying the protocol and changes to circumstances, I mean, these were genuine changes to circumstances, not, oops, I forgot something. Um, uh, and, as, and as results were coming through, uh, it was a lot easier, I guess, for the regulators to make decisions when you, you knew a lot about the trial, you, knew we had, you were very familiar with what the issues, the background issues and the questions were, even before you ever saw the data. So that, I think, is a real, a real positive and, and, and can be taken forward in many different ways. Related to that is that, in a sense, the purpose of doing a trial and the purpose of a regulator is to actually improve the quality of the licensed information, uh, the, license, in, the information on licensed drugs and which drugs are licensed. Um, in a sense, it's not to regulate trials, it's to regulate the medicines and to regulate health. I mean, that's the, the, so actually the trials are really important to help better regulation of which drugs are, uh, can be used or shouldn't be used for which types of patients. And then on the data point, I think you're absolutely right, Manny, that you, there's a huge set of advantages there from registries that are collected specifically in cardiovascular disease, cancer, and one or two other places, to things that are basically claims data, but you can think of them as registries, like in the UK, hospital episode statistics, or the civil registration, the death certificate data, or in the US, Medicare, uh, cl um, CMS claims data. Um, but I think that there is still a challenge with that, and I put this across the piece, 
including due to regulators, but uh, across the piece, into how one interprets and how much how one relies on those data. Yeah. And one of the issues is that if you have sensibly multiple sources of information about what happens to your patient, some of which is, if you like, the equivalent of witness statements. Patient comes to an interview in a clinic and, and is asked some questions. Have you had a heart attack since I saw you last? Did you have chest pain? Has your hair fallen out? All that sort of stuff. Uh, you've got some of which is uh, perhaps reported remotely by the patients and some of which is coming from these routine or registry data sources. You've got multiple sources of information they're not all going to match. They'll be out by a few days. Some, some, at a particular time, will know the patient's dead while others don't. And just as you would do if you were investigating a forensic crime scene, you would take each source of information and then come to a value judgment about what you think is most likely to have happened. So is the case in clinical trials. You shouldn't be expecting right the way from journal reviewers, people in companies, people who are data managers, people who are in regulators and so on, you shouldn't be expecting them all to match and you certainly shouldn't be trying to force them all to match. You wouldn't dream of going back to an eyewitness and saying you better state, change your statement about what colour that car was because the camera says it was blue and you said it was white. So I think that there's a real challenge around that about building up that level of confidence because it is a much better, more efficient, less loss to follow up, more diverse, um, both in terms of the types of patients, the duration of, of, income, of outcome information you can get, the range of outcomes you can get, the comprehensiveness. You know, there is a, there's substantial advantages, but uh, there, the, it doesn't behave the same way as uh, bog standard uh, case report form uh, might. And to call a case report form a gold standard, um, any clinician who's ever worked in any hospital will know very well that what's written in the notes is only as good as the last person, person who scribbled it down and the amount of time they had to do so. No, I was just going to say that there's a long history of basically making clinical trials more complicated and more expensive. And so what you're now talking about is a reversal of that. And you know, frankly, there is an incumbent interest in the complexity of the trials. And the recovery trial, as Martin knows, was a fantastic success. But at the same time, we were trying to do some phase two studies according to more traditional rules, and they just, none of them worked. It was a disaster. The patients all got excluded. Um, there are just too many reasons not to include people in studies, whereas people live in the real world. And so, I mean, my challenge is, I think it's, it is going to take disruption, actually. It will be new businesses, and I think that the regulator have an absolutely key role. And, and while I've got the microphone, I'm going to throw another sort of one in, which is that Another failure was we didn't get any antivirals, really. And I'm just wondering if the era of medicinal chemistry for infectious diseases is over. <laughs> Controversial. <laughs> I, th I think, so, uh, uh, should I answer just the antiviral question? Yes, I'll come back to you, Chris. So, uh, I think that's a bit harsh, we didn't get any antivirals. And it was interesting, because when we were working with Patrick on the 100-day the challenge, it was clear that antivirals weren't going to be in that same phase as a programmable mRNA therapy or a CHADOX or, or an antibody. And the difference is that an antibody is an antibody and you optimize the binding domain and then you know how it's going to behave. A small molecule will have idiosyncrasies or have pharmacokinetic issues or have tox issues and you have to really play those through um, and that will always take a little bit more time. Does that mean that small molecules are dead? Definitely not. Does it mean that antivirals are No, I don't think so. But it does mean that the pace at which you can do it is different. We've been very lucky. I mean, we haven't talked about the fact that what COVID has also done is advanced new technology platforms at a pace that we hadn't seen. We, 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 we were working with Moderna for, we, did, we signed our first agreement with Moderna in 2012, um, working in the cardiovascular and metabolic space. You know, COVID accelerated Moderna's journey, you know, by an incredible amount. And it highlighted what those platforms can do in terms of the speed at which you can pivot which is, I think, incredibly impressive. So small molecules, very important, but not, I think, the same speed as some of these programmable therapies. Please go ahead. No, I, I, th I think that's a very important point because if you look at monoclonal antibodies, there's a defined set of safety parameters for the most part, which for a small molecule just broadens that. And no one would think of trying to accelerate that at the expense of potential jeopardy for a patient. So. You see them coming in now for exactly, I think, that reason. There's still an unmet need. It's taken some more time. 
But the one thing I would like to potentially caution about, and I'm very excited about trying to get trials enrolled as quickly as possible, getting to data inflection points quickly. We also have to make sure, though, that those trials really represent the disease epidemiology. And the concern is, given the fact that many of these databases sit in only certain parts of the world, some of them are more homogeneous than others, we could potentially, unwittingly, by trying to move at pace, actually further disenfranchise whole parts of society. And so it's incumbent upon us to balance that pace and that speed with making sure that those trials truly reflect epidemiology of the disease under study so that we have the right data and those patients to be able to go out there confidently that this is as effective in all groups, um, not just the groups that we've studied. I completely agree with that, yeah. but I would say that the current, the current or traditional approach <coughs> fails on all those metrics. Yes. Um, you know, select, selecting a small number of large academic centres in whichever country you might think of, UK included, but North America, you know, US or wherever it might be, um, one, what all one recruits is the professor's favourite patients in small numbers. Mm -hmm. Um, and by and large, because of the structure of where those places are, those people are white, middle-aged, well-off, uh, able, to, able to travel, able to spend time, uh, and so on and so forth. So I think that the current system doesn't work. I agree that setting things only in registries and, and systems which are in a particular narrow focus um, can have its challenges. I think one should also think about diversity quite broadly, you know, what the North America refer to as an Asian population is not the same as what the UK or Europe would refer to as, a, as an Asian population. So I think one always has to keep thinking and working with people who are from diverse populations to actually really understand the issues. Um, but I think there are advantages here. I think we have to be careful just finally on technology. There are a lot of people who can now engage with Zoom, a lot of people who now have iPads, um, uh, who are old and frail and possibly dementing and so on and so forth, but there are also a lot of people who can't and haven't, haven't got that access or haven't got those skills. So again, we just need to be careful about not get, getting some sort of digital, um, uh, well, I suppose it's too strong a word, digital apartheid, if you like. So can I just build, build on that? If there's a learning, and, and this is one of our learnings, because we didn't go digital crazy, but... It obviously became very much in vogue. We, know we, we use something called the five R's in, in, uh, in AstraZeneca, which is something that we use to try and improve our probability of success. And we actually introduced a six R, and the six R was right digital. I can see Christina ahead of R&D digital. She's probably squirming a little bit now. But it was very interesting because we put it as a measure to try and incorporate and encourage teams to think about what digital solutions are, particularly during the pandemic when face-to-face -face was becoming a little bit more difficult. And what we ended up seeing is that teams are almost starting to use it for the sake of using it. It was actually making some of our protocols more, not less complicated, and more difficult to recruit than less difficult to recruit. And so we actually had to take it away, go back and actually think about how we think about those tools, exactly your point, Martin, to make sure they're enabling. There were lots of people that didn't want to be monitored 24 seven by three different devices and two different apps. And it actually made our trials incredibly difficult to recruit. So we've gone back and really had to rethink how we use our digital tools and when we use them, um, which I think is really every, important. Every tool and every setting, and one has to really think about what, are the, what is the question and what's the smartest way to answer that question. And the smartest way is to get a good answer and also to make sure that, that, that it's actually doable uh, and doable for patients on the ground, wherever they might be, uh, for the clinicians that you're relying on and so on and so forth. And build on what's there. So let's go to you. You've been very patient. Go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. Um, my question actually, I think is related to uh, the, the comment that Chris uh, just made and then uh, you built on. And this is around, well, one reflecting that epidemiology and diversity and specifically around the patient voice. Now I've been in, I had been in a number of different uh, forums and um, and meetings prior to the pandemic where there was this conversation around patient centricity, the importance of the patient voice, and how it was becoming more pronounced. And I think that one of the things we learned from COVID uh, was that this really became supercharged in terms of how, number one, patients, uh, I think COVID helped us to look and realize that patients um, are, first of all, kind of people, right? Because when you talk about vaccination, suddenly you're not talking of sick people, you're talking of just anybody sitting here who happens to be described as a patient. 
And that raised this intense conversation of which I was part, um, where people were then looking very, uh, you know, asking questions around why they should uh, believe in the provenance of the vaccines that they were asked to, to take. And one of the questions was around representation in clinical trials. So my question then is, what do we think we've learned from COVID in terms of getting that patient voice uh, included when, when it comes to clinical trial design such that the outcomes of the trials themselves are not then uh, questioned and then it becomes, it's up to people like myself then to try to kind of explain how these things work. Um, you know, it, could, it would make life easier for all of us if we could. Ali, can I ask that. you to take that first? <laughs> because you, you work a lot with patients and thinking through that. Go ahead. I mean, I, I wholeheartedly agree with all the other comments as well. And obviously, I'm biased towards digital. But, um, but you know, it's not one size fits all. And it really has to be by design. And I think what we learned over the last couple of years is, you know, what works for one patient doesn't work for another. And you need that flexibility and that agility to be able to think about what's going to amplify the connection between the patient and their clinicians and the choices that they may want to have around that. And, you know, to your point, you know, really physically taking that voice of the patient and understanding what matters. We actually do that through a patient council who sit on our product product design committee who, who advise and test on what would work and what do we think might work that they would just say, do you know what, that's just a waste of time for me in my day-to-day -day life. Whereas these things we would really value and that we don't just throw everything at every patient in every trial, but we really think judici judiciously about what makes a difference but also that we're not just digitizing and putting paper under glass, that we are changing the processes around that as well, because otherwise we add to that burden and we're not eliminating any of that burden. So really thinking about what eases burden, what eases and improves choice, and what improves um, selectivity of patients and opens access. So we were talking to a group the other day who were recruiting sickle cell patients in um, central Saharan Africa. And they run a sickle cell um, a, a, um, engagement program through WhatsApp. What they were struggling with was 4,000 patients would turn up at a clinic. Well, if we can offer them the ability to pre-screen and, and pre-select so that we save all those people coming to that clinic and really filter that down so that the productivity and the engagement time is enhanced, that's a win of itself. So you don't have to digitize everything, but think about the problem that we're trying to solve for and digitize those pieces, if that makes sense for that particular study. But to your point, you know, don't just digitize everything for digital sake. There are really, really high value aspects that can be um, supported, and particularly when they're guide guided by the voice of the patients about what they would accept and how they would appreciate that. And June, I know um, even ages ago, the MHRA really took quite a lot of time to hear from patients. What's sort of the future of incorporating the patient voice, you know, in, in the future of regulation? Well, it's quite clear that patient involvement in regulatory decision making is essential for trust and, as you've said so eloquently, um, you know, the acceptance of what, what a regulator decides. I'd like to shift the focus, though, to the opportunity of revising the clinical trials legislation. Um, it's been a bit of a learning um, uh, experience for me. I did not know until we started that discussion on the legislation that a patient might be in a trial and never know the outcome. Surely, if there's a cycle of involvement, it dictates that the pride and the altruism that we've seen during COVID, people volunteering in their, well, hundred thousands and more to be part of that learning, perhaps with no gain for themselves. We've got to respect that. We've got to reward it. So I'd like to see the legislative change that will come through in the autumn really represent the once in a generation chance to be inclusive, um, for diversity, for pregnancy, for children, and ensure that the results of studies are trusted for being relevant to those that will use the product. So let's take that opportunity. Let's get it right now. I completely agree with that. I mean, in so first of all, we've worked together on some of the sort of thinking about some of these issues. Um, I do remember being at a running a workshop with FDA representatives. Um, uh, pharma representatives, funder representatives, IRB ethics committee representatives, um, some clinical investigators and so on in, D in Washington DC about 10 years ago. And we put forward a protocol, it was a, a mock protocol, 
um, and said, you know, can you sort of critique this? Could, this you know, could you get this to be simpler and to answer the question? And the, uh, the patient representative put their hand up and said, it's not an interesting question. We'll never take part in this because we don't care about the answer. And the pharma representatives were shocked that the patient ha had a right even to say this. So I think we've moved a long, long way, for, a huge way from that. I agree completely with June about the transparency of results, but I actually think that it's, um, there's a combination of inclusion of the voice through the, throughout the journey, but also transparency of what the state of play is throughout the journey. And so in recovery, to give you some examples, we actually didn't include any patients in the divisional design because there weren't any patients with COVID back in, or, or to speak of, back in early March 2020. But we did, all, as we went through and as we developed various materials and so on, but we published every pro version of the protocol, the live recruitment numbers, uh, every result, every bit of training material. Um, uh, the results were there in lay language as well as in access to the journals and, in, and essentially in real time. And all that we made transparent and open. I've never understood why protocols are considered con confidential. Of course, the chemical formula or something, they might have some IP on that. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in, as a patient, if I take part in this, surely I should know what's going on. And to give you an example on the flip, so on, on the other end, to, to get to this informing of results, uh, last autumn, we wrote to uh, 35,000 surviving <coughs> participants in the recovery trial saying, first of all, you may not actually remember being in this trial because you were sick at the time. Uh, if you have questions, this is how to contact us. Uh, these are, if you like, technically, these are your rights and how to exercise them. Secondly, thank you for taking part. Uh, thirdly, um, here, are, here are what the results have contributed to, and here's the string of impact that that's had. Not just here are the links to the papers and so on, but also here's the real life uh, public health changes that have happened as a consequence of your involvement. So I think that those things are doable. Some of the mechanics are a bit tricky, um, and they require a bit of imagination, but I think all these things are important. And finally on recovery, to take the inclusion piece, including pregnant ladies, including um, uh, children, both in pretty small numbers. So frankly, we don't have a robust answer just in children for pretty much anything, or a robust answer just in pregnant ladies for pretty much anything, because there's too few of them. But it shows that actually an inclusivity and a willingness to involve those sorts of people, that then when the decision-making comes at the other end that June has to do, then actually one can say, look, actually it did involve people a little bit like you. Not like everybody, we, you know, we, did, we did our best. But we, can, we have involved those people, and that message, I think, has also been very positive. Go ahead. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I, to be fair, I think some of my questions probably been answered from <laughs> such an sorry. elegant, elegant <laughs> question from the gentleman before. Um, but I was just going to say, do you, do, would you agree that if you break it down the biggest learning or the biggest impact of COVID is that patients actually are aware of what clinical trials are and therefore trust them more? And, and does that mean that there is a, a window of opportunity now to, to build upon that? Or, or will it go away in terms of those accessibility questions in terms of getting diverse populations into trials for medicines outside of, you know, as you all said, a immediate global need? Chris, go ahead. Maybe I'll start a little controversial. I think depending on the geographic locale, there is more credibility, and in others, there is significantly less. And unfortunately, what COVID has done is it has politicized medicine. And so it gets to the robustness of the data that are coming forward, a rigorous review of that data, and getting credible spokes individuals to really go forward to take that into the communities. And while it's raised awareness of clinical trials, there are certain geographies, I can tell you just from firsthand knowledge, where there's more skepticism today than there was before COVID, unfortunately. So it's incumbent upon all of us working together to, I think, have a unified voice around what science is and what science can deliver, what clinical trials can deliver, but also their limitations to be very credible as we go out. And in other geographies, it's actually strengthened that scientific um, belief and the respect for what science can bring to make a difference. Um, I think we just have to titrate it by geography. I think that's, I think that's exactly right. I mean, again, uh, there's so much that we've learned that probably we can't talk about in a public forum like this in terms of the role of politicians, the role of media, the role of regulators, the role of farm. I mean, it's been, and there's been so much misinformation 
you know, I think in the UK actually it has been pretty good, and I think that the power of science and medicine has actually gone up, and I think people have listened more rather than less, but it's been so variable. And, um, and you know, particularly with vaccines, which obviously were, were an inflamed medicine class pre-COVID, it's fueled that fire even more and made it even more controversial and more difficult. So um, this, it, 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 I think it's been quite challenging. I think we do need to look at the role of every segment in terms of being able to actually articulate and explain, um, but also to make sure that we make good decisions and not bad decisions, and good decisions based on data and science and medicine, not based on rhetoric and political views. I think we've done more to normalize don't you think that uh, people who've tested positive immediately being asked if you'll join Panoramic? It becomes then the common parlance that people talk about, are you in a study? I know bits of Scotland where, are you randomised, people say, <laughs> over a cup of coffee. And that's what, we, <coughs> that's what we've got to move towards, that we're all in a contract in our NHS to contribute to learning. I mean, Gina, so I'm yeah. more positive than Chris. Gina, no, Gina, and, and Gina, I agree with that. And I think, but I think the UK has been unusual. I mean, one of the, I think, other really powerful pieces that we've seen in the UK during COVID is the power of the real world data generation post approval to show actually what the real efficacy is, you know, and symptomatic efficacy, you know, efficacy against severe disease and, and death. Uh, and that's having a system in place that can collect the data and it highlights what the importance of that is because, again, if you think about regulation and making good decisions to choose which drugs you approve and which drugs don't, you don't approve, which ones you do under conditional authorization, having a system that can actually then enable a regulator to make a good informed decision subsequent to a conditional approval is incredibly, incredibly powerful because it means you can get your drug in the, into the real world being tested. And if you think about what's happened with, you know, with the Alzheimer's drug, you know, in, in, in the US, which to me is, a, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a neuro neuroscientist, I've, I've grown up studying, studying Alzheimer's. I mean, if there was ever an opportunity to test a drug in the real world to work out, I mean, and I realize it takes a long time, but that's the type of approach that I think has been so powerful during COVID with, with the vaccines and the, um, and the other therapies. I think I if, you, if there's a regulator, um, a few thousand miles west of June, uh, who would say that there are two challenges. One is the evidence synthesis machine, which is essentially clinical trials and the other forms of evidence that, w that one needs to, um, to understand what works, what doesn't work, and, and, and what are the downsides. And the second is the misinformation challenge. And the two are related, but they're not the same. Um, I think one of the things we should be thinking about is not just about COVID, we should be thinking beyond COVID. I mean, the pandemic hasn't, hasn't ended, let's remember that. It might resurge, sorry, but also, there, but, but it, ha it isn't over around the world. But there are many other big health challenges which don't have the urgency um, uh, that, that uh, COVID does. Secondly, that for many, we've talked about pa involve the patients, but many people don't think of themselves as patients. And many people, for many conditions and for many therapies, what you're trying to do is to prevent them ever happening in the first place, <coughs> which is a very different thing. I mean, it, the definition of, of, of success is that nothing happens. <laughs> That's a really hard thing to think about and a really hard thing to engage people. And yet, if you think about you know, long-term uh, prevention of heart disease, of common cancer, of neurodegeneration, of, of uh, arthritis, and many other conditions, yeah, the most successful therapies are going to be the ones that are preventive, or at least substantially delaying. And that's a whole different mindset. It, you know, take patients, involve patients uh, who have disease and try and make them better is one challenge, is an important one, but take people and try to prevent them becoming patients in the first place is a whole different uh, ball game. And it will require a combination often of randomization and large scale evidence. So it's the data plus the coin toss focused on a good question and get a, good, and get a clear answer. 
So I know we're coming up to time. And I know there's two more questions in the audience, which I, we're not going to have time to do. Otherwise, I'm going to run terribly late. Um, unless, Mark, you're giving me permission to run late. <laughs> OK. So what I'll do is I'll just wrap up. I mean, it's interesting when you, when you set up a panel and you kind of think about what you're going to discuss, you've got sort of a, a way that you think the panel will run. And, and the brilliance of an audience and a live discussion is it goes in sort of ways that you hadn't thought. Um, I think what's critical and what's come to the fore is obviously the patient voice and the importance of that, as well as clinical trial diversity um, and equity. I think those are topics that are kind of really hitting very hard at the moment. Uh, I think, excitingly, you know, there's lots of digital technologies, but I think it's fair to say, in moderation, in certain settings, I think the challenge of, you know, getting large data sets from disparate sources and kind of pulling it together, both in pulling the, the dossier or the submission, whatever it is, together, and then from a regulatory perspective, how do you make sense of actually what that means? I think we've started to sort of scratch the surface, and hopefully there'll be a lot more in terms of using registries and using real-world evidence to really complement uh, what we have in terms of randomized control trials. Um, so thank you very much, and thank to everybody for a really lively discussion, and uh, enjoy the rest of the meeting.